All right. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to talk about the past, um, not the too distant past, and the present and the future. Yes, the future of the ad server. Some people think the much maligned and uh, commoditized ad server doesn't have much of a future, but we here at AppNexus think the future is really bright for the ad server and it's gonna contribute a lot of value for everyone in this room, so I hope to convince you of that today. But first, let's talk about the past. Now, I did um, help invent the ad server back in 1995, and uh, I'm not gonna take you that far back, I promise, it's not that long a history lesson, but I am gonna take you back to 2007. 2007 was arguably the heyday of the ad server. And a bunch of things happened in 2007. So just to get the context here, one thing that happened is Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, which is kind of amazing, because they're probably everywhere. In fact, yesterday we saw yet another new iPhone introduced. Um, very exciting. Um, Peyton Manning won his first Super Bowl. Uh, he won his second one right here in San Francisco just recently, so some things don't actually change that much. Um, the last Harry Potter book was released. Some of you may remember they were actually camping out outside bookstores for this book, which is kind of incredible. And then um, uh, our favorite TV show was introduced as well. But back to the ad server. It was the heyday of the ad server. And why do I say that? Because a lot of interesting things happened in 2007. Google acquired DoubleClick for $3.1 billion, which was a massive transaction and a huge validation of the ad server space. What happened after that? Microsoft acquired Aquanta for $6 billion. And then we saw all kinds of crazy things going on. Yahoo had their whole newspaper consortium, and they were selling ad tech. Um, WPP bought 24-7, and they were selling ad tech. You had AOL buy a whole bunch of companies and put together Platform A, and they were selling ad tech. And it felt like in 2007, Every major company had ad tech. This was going to be the, the innovation, the competition, the absolute glory days for ad serving and for publishing and for advertisers on the internet. So what happened? Well, over the next like five or six years, somehow everything fell apart. And virtually every one of these companies got out of the business. And after about... Mm, 2012, 2013, there was only one left, Google and DoubleClick. Fascinating. So what happens when there's no competition in a space like ad serving? Well, you get what you would expect. You get no innovation. And so for a long time, this is why people are thinking, ah, oh, ad serving, it's just boring, it's unsexy, it's like, you know, cement or something. It's, but, you know, it's just one of those things that has to be there. You know, another analogy is it's like a thermostat. It's one of those things that everybody has to have. It just sits there and does its job. It's boring. There's no innovation around it. And everybody, you know, it's an essential kind of piece of the infrastructure. It just sits there on the wall. Well, what actually happened with the thermostat? This is kind of interesting, right? A company came along and said, huh, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for innovation. Thermostats can do a lot more than just sit on the wall. They can tell whether you're home. They can anticipate when you're coming home and change the temperature. They can do a lot of things that are much more interesting and more beautiful than they did for years and years when they just sat on the wall. So where are we with the ad server in 2012 or 2013? We're with this thing that just sits there and doesn't have any innovation, doesn't look very nice. And in fact, for any of you who were at our summit last November, Brian did a great demonstration where he showed how publishers are taking ad servers and duct taping all these other pieces together with them to try and cobble together a complete solution so they can actually run their businesses. And so what we did in that same time period, a couple years ago, is we saw this as an opportunity, the same way Nest saw an opportunity in thermostats, and we decided that we were gonna enter the business. So here are a few things we did over the last couple of years. We made some acquisitions. We acquired companies like Alenti and MediaGlue. We acquired OAS, which is the, um, the open ad stream ad server. We acquired Yieldex, near and dear to my heart, of course. Um, and we introduced, last November, our own publisher suite to finally provide some competition for Google in the space. So this is our publisher ad server suite. It's now in production at a number of the largest um, sites on the planet. And we say, long live the ad server. So 
What does that mean for innovation that we've gotten now? That's the history lesson. We talked about the past. Now where are we with the present? Let's talk about some of the innovations that we've brought into the present that this competition is driving just over the last couple of years. And to help me talk about that, I want to bring on Danny Khatib from Livingly because Danny's been doing some very, very innovative stuff. They've seen just over the last year their CPMs almost double. So Danny, tell us a little bit about what you're doing here. Sure, absolutely. So for context, for those who don't know, Livingly Media, we are a women's lifestyle media publisher. We've been around for about 10 years. We have four consumer brands, Zimbio for entertainment, movies, and TV, Style Bistro for fashion and beauty, Lonnie for home decor and design, and our recently launched flagship, Livingly, for women's uh, lifestyle, career, love, and what have you. Terrific. Collectively, our sites reach around 25 million users per month. We do several hundred million page views per visit. Very high engagement site, over 20 page views per visit. And wow. we do over a billion ads a month. So we have a lot of inventory we need help selling. Wow, that's terrific. So tell us where you were like a year ago and, uh, and then what you did to get to, to take the next step. Sure, so around a, a year ago, we were acquired by Ofeminine, which is a subsidiary of the Axel Springer family. And we went through the internal transition of being a venture-backed company to a company that now needs to think about profit rather than revenue. As that metric changed, we took a holistic look at our sales strategy, and we made the big bet and the big decision to put programmatic core to what we were doing and make it our primary revenue driver rather and profit driver, rather than direct sales, which we felt would be hard to scale to the billion ad impressions that we needed. So halfway through the year, we made a big bet. We restructured our sales team. We went all in on programmatic. Oh, wow. Header bidding was one of the first components of the core strategy for us to go really deep into programmatic. Uh, we launched our first header bidder partner at the end of July. We're now up to eight integrations, and we've seen our CPMs almost double uh, in that time frame. So we wow. went from unprofitable and most of our programmatic revenue coming from one source that starts with a G, 90% uh, <laughs> of our revenue. Now we've doubled it and that one revenue source is now down to 40% uh, of the revenue we're bringing in. So we have a much more diversified revenue base than we did this time last year. Wow, that's tremendous. And the tremendous. profit helps. Yeah, so, and, and profitable too, which is, which is really great. Yeah, we've been profitable for almost seven months in a row. First time we ever had a profitable Q1. I almost cried when we closed the books. Wow, very impressive. Yes. Terrific. And then, what, so what's been the impact on user experience? I mean, people are always worried about that. So what, what have you discovered about that? We were as nervous as anybody about uh, the user experience impact of header bidding. We, are, we have always been very passionate. We did not want to run a lot of JavaScript on our I'm pages sure. to slow things down. At 20 page views per visit, we care a lot. Any small latency can have a real impact. We measured and tuned everything, and we're still doing over 20 page views per visit. Wow. Uh, Brian O'Kelly, in his opening remarks, had mentioned how when some publishers see a quadrupling of CPMs, they have the affordability to consider either creating more content or reducing ad load. In our case, once we doubled CPMs, we took one of the ads off of our pages. And in aggregate, wow. between integrating header bidding and removing one ad, we doubled our revenue, and our pages per visit actually went up. Holy cow. The that's... cost of an ad is a lot more than the cost of a bid. Oh, that's really interesting. That's great to know. So, so, um, so tell us then, maybe just uh, to, to wrap it up, like where do you see this going? I mean, you, you've been working on this for a year. You've seen tremendous results. Like what's, what's next? Right. So header bidding is essentially a workaround for us because the ad server that we use, DFP, does not have uh, access to open marketplaces, it's sort of integrated deeply with one marketplace. Right. So header bidding, by definition, it's a workaround. It shouldn't need to be. In the future, we shouldn't need to be building hacks around what we view as core to how we want to make money. And at the end of the day, our view is, and header bidding has proved it, it's our inventory, it should be our marketplace, and as long as we have a way to control our marketplace, we'll make more money. That's really, that's terrific. So you heard this, you know, out of the horse's mouth here, going from 100%, 90% dependence on one uh, provider and unprofitable to using some of the competition, the innovation in the marketplace to really drive profitability and substantial increase in CPMs. Danny, thank you so much for joining Absolutely. us. Really thank appreciate you. it. All right. <laughs> terrific. So next, I'd like to bring out another case study, actually, to, to reiterate and to continue to emphasize 
you know, innovation, competition in the ad serving is driving innovation that's driving real value for publishers. You just saw a, a huge swing in profitability for these guys. This next one I'd like to introduce, Felix Tay, who is our head of monetization here at AppNexus. He works with lots of our publishers. Felix, great to see you. Great to see you, Tom. Um, he works with a lot of our publishers to help them with their monetization. And this next story he's going to tell you is about a publisher generating over a million dollars of additional revenue effectively out of thin air. Here we go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Felix. I'm your friendly neighborhood monetization partner here at AppNexus. Um, today, I'm going to share with you a case study, a case study that will help you answer the question of what can my ad server do for me beyond just serving ads? Because here at AppNexus, we would like to think that an ad server can really help you improve your monetization performance. Before we get started, one quick disclaimer. There were entities that were involved in making these case studies. Publisher, SSP, I won't be naming those names. One name that I do can share with you, though, is this particular publisher uses DFP as their ad server. So uh, back to the original question. Can this publisher ad server really help this publisher to monetize their inventory better? Um, in this case, the answer is not a simple yes or no. It's more like when you select your relationship status on Facebook as it's complicated. Um, we need to work together. This ad server will need an extra help in order to make magic happen. So let's get to it. Take a look at the chart behind me. The chart behind me shows a publisher's inventory distribution. If you're interested in monetization, there's probably one area in that chart that you're looking at right now. That's right. It's the one that is marked as unfilled, 53%. How do I make that go down so that I can improve my revenue? Like Tom said, creating things out of thin air, uh, the obvious answer to that would be, I need more demand. Great. But what if I tell you that is off the table right now? Well, actually, the exciting thing is, we could actually increase the fill rate by just leveraging the existing demand that we have, as long as we utilize them better and more proper. Let's take a look at the SSP one. That's going to be our focus. First, we will start by understanding the lay of the land. So using the data from our ad server, we know that this SSP one consumed 9% of our inventory. Fortunately for us, this, ad serv uh, this SSP one was also a header bidding partner. By virtue of that SSP one being a header bidding partner, we know that this SSP one actually was interested in buying 43% of this publisher's inventory. So that's kind of like a one to five win to lose ratio. The next thing that we need to do is we need to understand what really happened. So the whole question of, hey, I submitted a bid, I lost the auction, what happened? That is a very loaded question. So let's try to parse it out. Um, let's get back into the core of auction mechanics where, let's say, on the horizontal axis there, you have your bid, CPM, and on the vertical axis, you have your win rate. This is the relationship that we kind of expect to see. You know, when I bid low, I don't really win that much impression. When I bid high, I expect to win. All right, Yieldex, show us what really happened in reality. Boom. Uh, oh, no, actually, that shouldn't be a boom, because when I bid low, I was kind of winning a little bit more than I expected, but when I was bidding 10 to $20, I didn't win enough. And that is the problem, you see. That 10 to $20, that is a lot of money. That means somebody else was winning that impression. So again, we look at Yieldex and try to find out who won. Ah, it's the good old guaranteed campaign. So imagine, let's say, for example, Nike. They wanted to take your entire sports section, one million impression for nine bucks CPM. Great. There is one problem though. A direct guarantee campaign is paying you a flat CPM. Why is that direct campaign consuming more impression as your bid from this SSP was in the 10 to 20 bucks? You're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, because you know, this publisher only has one million impression available in the sports section, so it kind of needs it. All right, fine. But that's when we use the second functionality of Yieldex, which is forecasting. Because with forecasting, 
we were able to find out what was the true availability of the sports section. And we found out in this particular case study, it was definitely more than one million. So uh, yeah, going back to the big picture, taking a step back. I think the analogy that I would like to give is like, Nike and this SSP one were kind of like two kids trying to fight for the same pizza slice. That's all fine, except when there's a lot of pizza left on the table. That's the problem. Like, that's a lot of pizza left that is just not being touched. We need to please eat that pizza and not fight for the same slice. So uh, what we decided to do is we decided to do a workaround. As you can probably relate, uh, we couldn't change the engine of the ad server. So what we decided to do is we did a manual overwrite. Uh, manual overwrite is basically to separate those two Nike and SSP1 to not fight for the same pizza slice. Um, or in ad tech speak, basically what we did, every time we see a key value pair targeting, indicating that, the, that SSP1 was interested in buying the publisher's inventory, we decided to do a negative targeting for the direct campaign so that the two will not be competing for the same inventory. As you can expect, that happened. Finally, we got the 10 to $20 bid. We got it. So let's summarize. This is where we started. The process that we did, the workaround that we did, was all those things on the right, and this happened. 8% mole fill rate, great. You're probably wondering, why is 8% mole fill rate that great? Let me tell you two reasons why. Well, first, the 8% fill rate will increase your revenue by a lot more than 8%, because if you remember again, the bids that we're starting to win now is the 10 to $20 bid. The second reason why we are super excited is because we were only getting started. We only did this for SSP1. As you can see in that chart, there were a lot of other SSPs that we can basically replicate this process to that will further enhance your revenue. Now, um, there are two things that we are not too psyched about, though. Well, number one, uh, again, we cannot change the engine, so this is still a manual override. Manual override will require a lot of man hours and it's kind of manual. Second is, look at all those different pieces up there. There's header bidding, there's manual override, there's shield X. Those were all the different pieces that are basically duct taped to the ad server. Back to the original narrative. This is why we believe competition in the ad server space to be very important, because competition breeds innovation. An innovation that we hope one day will give you this, and you finally can answer the question when people ask, what can your ad server do for you? It is definitely more than ad serving. It can improve my monetization performance. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. That was terrific. Thank you, Felix. All right, so um, let's review a few of the present day. We we're talking about past, present, and future, present day innovations that we've brought to ad serving. We talked about open dynamic allocation. You heard Danny from Livingly talk about how important it was to pull in all these sources of demand, how they went from unprofitable to profitable and doubling their CPMs by bringing all the sources of demand into one place. And at Nexus, we built an ad server that does that in the ad server. And we've added additional innovations like one tag that brings in all the different formats. So you can have the rich media and the banners competing with the video and the native to make sure that you're getting full value for every opportunity to serve an ad. Now, there are some other innovations we've introduced, like accurate forecasting. We heard Felix talk about how the forecasting actually helps you figure out when your direct guaranteed campaigns are consuming inventory that they shouldn't be, and how the publisher that he was talking about generated a million dollars of additional revenue by being able to forecast effectively. We saw, for those of you who were here last uh, November, you saw Dave Smith from Pandora talk about how important the accurate forecasting was for Pandora and what's going on with them. So forecasting, another major innovation that we've brought to the table here today. And then we're also announcing today the availability of viewable guarantees. One of the things we've built into our platform, because it's a new platform, is viewability from top to bottom. Viewability is a first class metric in our platform. So when buyers are asking for a million impressions, 100% guaranteed viewable, 
you can actually go into your ad server and run a forecast on a million viewable impressions. See how much that's gonna take out of your inventory, book that thing right there, and let it run, no muss, no fuss, and be confident that you're gonna get a million viewable. Isn't that great? Your ad server actually does it for you. So these are some of the innovations that we've brought to the table today. But I also promise to talk a little bit about the future. So let's talk about the future. Let's take a look. In the not too distant future, these are not way pie in the sky things. These are things that we're working on right now. So the first question I want to ask you is, you know, how many people in this room, and we've heard from a lot of you, have discovered that as they go more and more programmatic, they have to hire more and more people? Wait, doesn't that defeat the purpose of programmatic? Isn't the whole point to have the computers do all the work? So what if we could get to a point where the ad server actually does the programmatic by itself and lets the humans do all the creative stuff? Just like you see 3D printers are doing the manufacturing now, but the people are able to do the creative, the innovative stuff on top of it. And the kinds of innovation that that's freed up uh, our humans to do has is, is really been amazing. So think about what happens if the ad server can do the programmatic part by itself and work with the humans, the people, to be able to actually do the creative part that delivers the real value. That's one thing. Number two, a little more prosaic, is dynamic pricing. Now, this is an example from retail. But in retail, we're finding that, that different sellers on the internet are actually changing the prices for the same thing throughout the day in response to each other's competitiveness and in response to um, you know, uh, the, the buying beh uh, behavior. Why don't we see more of this in ad serving? Why doesn't the ad server recognize the changes in the environment and do better dynamic pricing to make sure that we're taking advantage of those changes in the environment? So there's another thing, dynamic pricing. And then the last thing I want to bring to the table is this balance between user experience and revenue. You actually heard Rhiannon from Shazam mention this on the panel, talking about how important it is to balance the user experience with the revenue. Even Danny talked about taking out one ad and making sure that they balance the user experience against the revenue. But wouldn't it be great if your ad server could actually do this balancing act for you? For example, you know, if you want to get really innovative here, imagine that you have a particularly high value user coming in and viewing your site. They're a CEO or they're an auto intender. Maybe you only serve them one ad, a really high value ad. And if the next person that comes into your site turns out you don't know anything about them, they're anonymous or they're cookie-less, maybe you go ahead and serve them more ads because you need to monetize them more effectively. Right? So why can't your ad server actually do these things? Um, automatically, without you having to do a lot of manual intervention. So these are the kinds of things, when you think about it, you know, having the ad server really do the programmatic part, having the ad server do the dynamic pricing, having the ad server do a better job of um, you know, balancing user experience with monetization. But all this comes back to, if you don't have the competition, you're not going to get the level of innovation. And so what we're bringing to the table here is the competition that lets this innovation really take flight. And make no mistake, we understand this is, a, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. And we are in this game to win it. We are investing hundreds of millions of dollars. We have hundreds of engineers working on this right now. This is a game we're going to win. And we're going to continue to drive the innovation that brings all of that value for all of the people in this room. That is what drives us. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.